You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com and co-hosts, Alex, the voice Roy Jacobson from Options Express, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew, the rock lobster, Joe Venazzi, and Mark, the greasy meatball, Sebastian from optionfit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. Welcome back to the Option Block. We are, of course, your bi-weekly source for all things options related. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as from the ever-expanding, ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. If you're one of the many people out there right now who are reading the new Michael Lewis book about the markets being rigged and HFT and all that interesting stuff, then by all means, check out the latest edition to our radio network, Trading Tech Talk. We dive into all that great stuff. HFT, is it rigged? Answer all those kind of questions. A lot of great stuff. Trading Tech Talk, check it out. I think you're going to like it. And while you're checking out that show, make sure you download our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app available for iOS and Android and Amazon Kindle Fire. You can, of course, stream all 300 plus episodes of the Option Block as well as download them to listen to them offline, on the subway, on the commuter rail, wherever you like to listen to our fine programs. You can, of course, listen to all the other episodes of every other program here on the network as well. The Options Insider Radio Network mobile app. Check it out in your app store of choice. All right. And joining me on the old all-star panel today, first up, we have the man from St. Charles, known far and wide as Uncle Mike None other than Mr. Mike Tussaw from RCM Wealth Advisors and RCM Asset Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the show, sir. Always a pleasure to be here. I know I say that every day, but it is always a pleasure to be here. All right. I like it. And also joining us from the from actually, I can't tell where he's from today, so I'm going to guess he's from Casa Jacobson, none other than the Viceroy himself, good old Alex Jacobson, holding down the options expressed by Charles Schwab seat. Mr. Jacobson, welcome back to the program, sir. It's good to be back, and I am uh, at OX today, uh, ironically, but uh, it's good to be here. The stability of your connection threw me, sir. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll give it five minutes and you'll be the firewall will kick in again. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we are also joined by the greasy meatball himself. Good old Mark Sebastian beaming in from Swan Wealth Advisors as well as OptionPit.com. Mr. Sebastian, welcome back to the show, sir. Hello. Hello. How's everybody doing? It is a gorgeous day here. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to get the show over with and then uh, get outside. <laughs> You're excited. I just I just curtailed some time in the pool down here in sunny Florida just for the show. That's how committed I am to you oh, option block nice. listeners out there. What so, a nice yeah. guy. I had my tie in hand. I was enjoying life. And I said, you know what? I have to go talk to these guys for a little bit. So my life is indeed a difficult one. But we'll get to that. <laughs> now it's time for the trading block. 
It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, and welcome to The Trading Block. This is, of course, the portion of the program where we break down what was moving, what was lighting up the old tape today. And it was a bunch of green on the screens today as the Fed and Ukraine tensions seem to combine to do a one-two punch to move the market northward. Most of the major indices closing up nearly a full percentage point or very close to it. Uh, S&P closing up about eight-tenths of a point or nearly 15 handles, uh, excuse me, eight-tenths of a percentage point or nearly 15 handles to 1872. The Dow closing up the same percentage or 135 handles to 16,457. And the queues lagging a wee bit, but not too far, only up about three quarters of a percentage point. VIX Cash, of course, taking it to the chin today down about half a point to 13.86 and again a lot of that a lot of that boisterous news in the market really uh, causing the rally of course we had Yellen coming out uh, a lot of people were worried earlier that the Fed was going to start kicking in with the rate hikes perhaps a little bit sooner some people had guessed her comments today and recently uh, really seemed to be backing people off of that uh, that expectation and the market's rallying as a result we're also seeing uh, some of the some of the loggerheads perhaps being resolved out there in the Ukraine. So I think the combination of those two things really, really uh, moving the markets to the north today. Uncle Mike, we'll switch it up. We'll start with you today. What was what was the BBI like today and what really caught your eye in today's activity? I had a couple of adjustments that I, that I made, but I'll discuss that more in the strategy block a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> I'm noticing just in the macro market, that was the main thing that went up, obviously. Uh, looking at uh, my beloved Apple, uh, really not too much movement in that today. And then I'm also, the other thing that I noticed is that even with the news that came out today, uh, I follow FXI as well, the Chinese ETF, and we didn't have a lot of movement there either. Uh, so... I mean, obviously, it's a, a big move to the upside. And then the other thing that I noticed, too, is that for this big of a move to the upside, uh, I'm just looking at TLT uh, as well as IEF. Didn't really have a big move to the downside there. So interesting, to say the least. I think interesting was a good way to describe today's activity. A lot of cool stuff in a lot of broad sectors. You mentioned TLT. I think what caught my eye as well, in addition to the broad market stuff, was what's going on out there in commodities land. Uh, we of course had the big March 31st for the first. Wow. We of course had the big March 31st report really hitting the uh, the grains and the ags. A uh, corn was off to the races. This of course with today's move makes it the best start to a year for corn since 2008. Uh, soybeans also hit their highest level in nine months. A lot of people were coming into that crop report expecting uh, uh, it to take it on the chin and drop a bit. And now of course we actually saw a lot of people were surprised to see that supplies are actually tightening. So uh, those markets off to the races as well. Alex, I know you've mentioned on the show in the past that there's been a lot of activity on the futures and futures options side for OX uh, in that gas and other products. Has this boom in the ags today, did that really take up some time on the desk? Were there a lot of calls coming in for corn and the beans and some of the other big products out there? Yeah, exactly. The, in fact, when I surveyed the desk, I'm, I, I'm actually now in my new spot, one floor above the desk. So we ping each other. But when I surveyed Mike Zarensky, who's our uh, futures pro, uh, he echoed exactly what you said, Mark. The people were surprised by the crop report and they were active in, in, in both the underlying futures and uh, the options on the futures. And again, that's an area that in some senses to me is, is not a surprise, but the traction that futures options have got uh, continues to it, it just continues to be runaway growth in that marketplace. All right, aside from the ags, anything else catching your eye? Anything else lighting up the old tape out there in OX land today, Mr. Viceroy? Three things: two momentum stocks are still su suffering, Tesla and Amazon, and one of the desk perennial favorites, uh, Lulu, which had gotten quiet for a while, uh, has gotten a couple of upgrades lately. It is back into the low 50s, and it's starting to get some trade lift here again. And I still think a lot of that is sitting in the in customers' accounts, both at uh, here at Options Express and at Schwab. It was I think it was Motley Fool's top pick for 2012. So this move back above 50 has generated a lot of activity in uh, in the trading of the options in Lulu. 
Uh oh, Motley Fool's top pick. That means they bought more dedicated emails through Motley Fool than any other name in that past year. No, of course. I'm just being quite silly, as my little guy would like to say. Uh, Mr. Sebastian, what uh, what caught your eye in today's movements as well while you were busy constructing overlays and whatnot? You know, just the, the way they just torched volatility today. I don't know if you saw, but the vol futures just ate it um, in, in size. So, you know, you got the VIX down a half a point, but you got the April future down about a half a point. So this is the first time we've really seen vol futures outperform the cash VIX in some time. And, you know, kind of points toward what's been happening where we kind of see a little torchage on Monday and we don't see the normal weekend decay on a Friday. So that's that's really kind of the big trend that we noticed. And so, yeah, as I'm looking at at vol, I mean, it's just it was just uh, an absolute torching of VIX and RVX and VIX futures kind of across the board. And, you know, maybe rightly so. There's a nice spread between these things. Something's got to give eventually, and it's just taken uh, taken its, itself a while. You know, we touched on that a bit on vol views last week because you're right. It was another one of those weird weekends where vol caught a bid going into the weekend, and yet there was indeed this – this steep slope to the term structure, particularly out there in the VIX futures, where you saw a significant premium as you started going out in the months. Sounds like they uh, took that off the table today and taking off what they should have taken off maybe on Friday, on Monday, as usual again. People are scared of the weekends again. Maybe that's a good thing collectively. People are starting to to realize there is some literal weekend risk out there with all these crazy macro events going on. And perhaps they don't blast out all the premium going into Friday afternoon the way they have usually been. So perhaps... Uh, perhaps that's a learning curve for everyone out there, C certainly for the listeners of this show, who I know uh, majority fall into the dark side of the premium selling camp. If they if they learn to keep their powder dry for a weekend or two or perhaps even buy something every now and then, it might, might be an interesting development uh, for all involved. Speaking uh, of interesting developments, I know a lot of you guys out there have written in asking about – the big hot thing in the trading tech and the trading landscape, pretty much finance landscape across the board. It is, of course, Bitcoin. Everyone and their mother is obsessed with it. A lot of you have written in about when are we going to get Bitcoin derivatives? When are we going to get Bitcoin options? Uh, well, we're seeing some movements toward that recently. We saw it coming out of the Atlas ATS, uh, which announced a new upgrade to their platform. And the interesting thing for listeners of this show uh, they launched Atlas 2.0 in Hong Kong and North America, which includes two types of options contracts. Calls and puts, very, uh, very, very, uh, very uh, imaginative naming there. Uh, they allow the owner to write to buy and sell the underlying cryptocurrency at a set strike price on a given expiration date. I have no idea what's going into the actual construction of these contracts, but nonetheless, it is an interesting development uh, that a lot of you I know are very, very keen to see. Again, take all this stuff with an enormous grain of salt. Uh, we saw the largest or second largest exchange, depending on your point of view, uh, for these products melt down recently. Uh, Atlas 2.0, who knows uh, how long they'll be in this game or how liquid these products actually will be. But of course, um, yeah, but for all of you guys who keep writing in about Bitcoin, Bitcoin options, Bitcoin options, here at least is some news in that general direction. Alex, I have to imagine you guys probably get that call even more than we do <laughs> over here at Insider. Uh, are the people over there at OX, the clients, are they clamoring to get their hands on some Bitcoin options or futures? Yeah, yeah, it comes up a lot. And uh, I will tell you my own personal view is I think cryptocurrency is going to have a big future. Um, I, I, you know, know that almost every firm on the street is – Got some research people working on cryptocurrency. The 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 downside to it is, I think the real traction will be in the next generation of cryptocurrency, and I think that will regrettably leave Bitcoin behind. And uh, I know as soon as I say that, I need to clear my email box because I'll get inundated. Uh, but I think cryptocurrencies will really be a thing of the future. I just think it will look more like a banking product. Um, you know, the IRS came back and said it's not a currency. It's simply an investment item. And and I'm in agreement with that. I don't think that was any groundbreaking ruling by the IRS. Uh, but I think five years from now, three years from now, we'll be talking about cryptocurrencies as a regular thing. 
you know, that seems to be the consensus from a lot of people who are uh, quote unquote in the know in this space is that Bitcoin is going to take it on the chin for everyone else to follow. They're going to get they're they're the pioneers. So they're going to take it from the regulators. They're going to take it from all the other different uh, speculators and scammers out there who are doing a lot of interesting and dubious things with this product right now. And it's going to encounter all the problems. But then you're right down the road. A lot of others will probably follow in the wake and they'll have they'll have a smoother road to hoe because Bitcoin kind of paved the way for them. So who knows whether Bitcoin will be around, but something probably in of its ilk will be around down the road as well. Speaking of this kind of uh, the fringe area of trading and tech and finance, I just want to get your guys' comments on this as well. I mentioned at the top of the show, and this is mostly a subject for our trading tech talk show, but I want to give you guys a chance to weigh in on it if you like as well. Of course, a lot of people talking right now about what's going on with Michael Lewis and his new Flash Boys book. Uh, he was on 60 Minutes, uh, stirring up a lot of controversy there, saying the markets are rigged, saying, quote, the insiders are able to move faster than you. They're able to see your order and play it against other orders in ways that you don't understand. They're able to front run your order. And now we hear a lot of this stuff all over the place. It's very very uh, histrionic, it's very hyperbolic. Uh, but when it's someone like Michael Lewis, who wrote seminal books like Liar's Poker and others, it tends to have a little bit more weight, a little bit more gravity behind it. Uh, what else? He went on to say that these guys are masterminding, masterminding a rigged market and talking about other things. He even got into a back and forth Twitter war uh, with the CEO of Bats, William O'Brien. Uh, kind of interesting stuff going on. He's obviously diving deep into the HFT is evil, HFT is front-running the markets and, and disad, disadvantaging uh, the little guy, which is kind of an interesting and kind of controversial topic because you're the big block traders. You can see where the liquidity goes up for them, uh, and you could see some of the issues they might have with this practice. You can see the market makers getting squeezed by these guys and certainly having uh, issues with HFT from that perspective. But for the little guys, it's kind of a more difficult argument because these guys are coming in and just – kind of taking liquidity across the board anyway. And they're probably interacting with these guys and, and getting somewhat decent fills. Uh, so it's an interesting debate. I want to let you guys uh, chime in on it before we have the big, big, lengthy debate over there on Trading Tech Talk. Uncle Mike, this doesn't really fall in your in your bailiwick that much. Is this really any clients calling up on this? Anyone really? Uh, or you're not even paying attention to this over there at while you're watching your GLD? <laughs> no, we pay attention to it by all means. But for the most part, in with what we're doing, it really isn't a huge issue in anything that we do. And uh, if it is, then they're really that much faster that we don't even notice it. There you go. They're in, they're out before you see it. And then you're you're happier and none the wiser. Uh, Mr. Sebastian, I know you take a lot of umbrage of this kind of thing and at the general viewpoint that the markets are rigged. But of course, at the end of the day, people have a lot of money at stake. They're going to invest hundreds of millions or billions of dollars into faster systems. That's kind of just the way the market Yeah, I mean, I don't have, I, I think the issue is the rules, not the, uh, not uh, the, uh, the HFT guys. I mean, if you want to ruin, I've said this probably a thousand times. If you want to get rid of HFT, get, if you want to get rid of 90% of HFT, Get rid of payment for order flow and it'll all go away. Um, because if you look at how these guys are gaming stocks and options, it's almost always a payment game. It's almost always about not front running to try and get a hundredth of a cent, but front running so that you can pay the price at the cover that you can pay on some uh, exchange that pays for you to take the offer and then sell it right back to the customer on some exchange that pays you for making the offer and arb that. I mean, that is where all of the HFT game is. And if you want to get rid of it, get rid of payment for order flow, which should be illegal anyway. You know, that's an interesting point, and not to uh, not to toot our own horn too much, but we did just record an excellent episode that's coming up of Trading Tech Talk with Blair Hull, a pioneer in options technology and someone who knows quite a bit about this area of the space. And he did also pin a lot of the ills of HFT on things like Reg NMS and went out and said, actually, the SEC has, has caused and created a lot of the problems right now which HFT because of their lack of understanding of the space. So listeners, I encourage you, that should be coming out in the next week or so. If you really want to dive into this topic, that episode is going to be fascinating for you guys. Alex, take us home on this one. Uh, is, is this really a cause of consternation with the clientele over there at OX? Or are they kind of more focused on the option space where, quite frankly, HFT isn't that big of a player right now? 
It's some of both. And as much as it pains me to agree with Sebastian, he's right. Um, and, and um, you know, when you talk about the Blair Hole episode, I obviously haven't heard it yet. But uh, if not the smartest man in the derivative space up there with smart people. Um, in 2012, the high frequency firms earned over a billion dollars. Uh, to Sebastian's point, some of that was gaming maker taker. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, maker taker needs to change or go away. It's on Jeff Sprecher's list, and he now owns the second biggest stock exchange and uh, probably the second biggest options exchange. Uh, consortium, but uh, they didn't make a billion dollars uh, in 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 pure trading profits. I mean, that was friction. That was an expense. Uh, it is going away. They didn't earn that kind of money in 2013, and they're not earning that kind of money in 2014. So uh, if they're gaming maker-taker, which it appears to be the case, uh, then yeah, we need to figure it out. And somebody paid that billion dollars. And uh, uh, in the end, it's all friction to the customer. It, it, it's this big question of who's the customer. And at some point, the regulators are going to have to sit down and f figure that out. And they're going to have to identify some customers as uh, customers we, the community, don't want. You know, you're right. Uh, Maker Taker started off, particularly in the options space, with some interesting and perhaps even noble intentions of ways to try to incentivize liquidity and give give liquidity providers more skin in the game and give them some incentives to actually stay in there and make two-sided markets. And it since has been morphed and it has evolved into all sorts of weird permutations that have taken it very far afield from where it was initially intended. And I think that's why people like Jeff Sprecher and others are starting to really push back on it now as a sort of really, really disruptive influence in the marketplace. Speaking of disruptive influences, it is time for us to keep on rolling right on into the most disruptive part of the show by far, because it's time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, welcome to The Odd Block. This is, of course, the portion of the program where we break down the interesting the bizarre, the sometimes downright weird stuff that's going on in the old options market, starting off uh, with a name we haven't really talked about in the old odd block before. This is Gen Pact Limited, ticker symbol G, uh, closing today $17.42, up about a quarter on the old day. This is a name that does usually 400 contracts a day, doing a whopping 21,000, uh, so a ton of paper going up. In this name today, a couple of weird trades actually going up out here. What we profiled on the site today, listeners, uh, was a big block of the April 17 half puts uh, going up for prices around 65 to 75 cents. That went up 1,250 times. No open interest really to speak of. So it's all brand new opening paper. Uh, looks like it was pretty aggressive put buying, particularly at the time. This was about a 40 cent wide market on these puts, and this guy was lifting the offer. Uh, so someone really wanted to get into these puts in quite a hurry and didn't really care uh, where they got in. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Usually we're profiling here the crazy out of the money call buys. This is an at the money put buy, actually, which is kind of interesting. Of course, later on in the day, what really is bizarre kind of went up is it looks like a a 10,000 lot of either a straddle or perhaps a combo went up. I have to check the numbers quickly here on the April 20 strike, which is something that went up later. We didn't have a chance to write it up on the old site. Uh, 10,000 of the April 20s. Again, those are pretty much worthless offered at a dime. And 10,000 of the April 20 puts. These are two and a half dollar in the money uh, puts. Uh, so interesting stuff. About 8,000 open on each of those strikes already so there could be some closing paper going on plus a little bit of extra on the top we'll have to dig into this a little bit more listeners maybe we'll write it up again for the site tomorrow like i said i'm just seeing this volume for the first time as i'm reading this myself 
But looks like the bulk of the volume that went up today in Genpact was way outside of those 17 half puts. And we'll have to get more more data on that and what price they actually went up on on that 10,000 lot. And then we could we could parse it a little bit more for you. But keep an eye on this one because there is in terms of weird paper going up here. This one has weird written all over it with a capital capital W. Now we're going to move on to our next name. This is everyone's favorite ticker symbol TV Grupo Televisa SAB. Not surprisingly, this is an American depository receipt uh, closing today. Thirty three dollars and twenty nine cents up about half a buck or about one and a half percent. And what we saw today was well, so the name that usually does about 500 contracts a day doing about twenty seven hundred today. Pretty much all of that in the calls uh, what we saw was a bunch of the April 30s going up for looks like around three dollars and 15 cents. Uh, we also saw the 831s going up for two dollars and 35 cents and the 834s going up for 55 cents. It went up in three blocks. Uh, looks like the 34s were probably a sale uh, and then the rest could have been. Uh, could have been buys here because they went up on the bids so at 750 of the April 30s, 235 of the 31s, and then a thousand of the April 34s. So it could have been a weird, a weird ratio, stupid as well. So Tucson may be playing out here in the you oval. Call me. <laughs> I know you love uh, you love TV. This is your favorite name. I know you love to watch TV. I'm not sure how much you trade it, but uh, either way, this is an interesting one for you here. Again, three big blocks. If you're wondering what this is, this is a Mexican-based company engaged in broadcasting for the Spanish-speaking Latin American countries. Uh, so interesting stuff going on here as well. All right, and we're going to finish things up here in the old odd block with a name we've been talking about a lot, it seems like, lately in the odd block. No surprise. Uh, this is the I MSCI Emerging Markets ETF, also known as EAM. EEM closing today, $41, roughly even up about a quarter on the day. And given everything we saw in Argentina and then the Ukraine, this name has been on a, quite a wild ride over the past few months. And we saw some interesting activity going up again today. In particular, we saw the May 41 halves really lighten up the tape. We saw 57,000 235 to be precise <laughs> going up on this strike open interest only 7000 contracts so this is all open in paper even more interesting it went up in one in one size block of course a chunk of that uh, was marked as a sale concurrently so some of that could have been facilitating uh, this trade to help the original volume going up but it looks like pretty much the bulk of this volume is a straight up opening buy so we're looking here again at eam and the closing today 41 dollars. so this is not our typical trade we're profiling here in the odd block where someone buys a five percent or even ten percent out of the money call this is a straight up very very near at the money call and buying a large large amount of them so this is a very a very near term uh, actually total on the day by the end of the day when we profiled this it was 50 it was in the 50,000 range, 57,000. By the end of the day, we saw a total of 163,000 of these May 41 half calls going up for all sorts of prices throughout the day. So this is just ridiculous volume. I didn't see, and our, uh, our analyst here didn't see any stock going up with this. I have to imagine that a good chunk of it did because uh, this kind of stuff has to be facilitated to go up in this amount of size, and someone's got to hedge that with some stock. Mark, I know you don't you don't watch Eam a whole heck of a lot, but of late it's been moving quite a bit. And did this activity catch your eye at all today? Uh, in uh, Eam, it's uh, it's certainly uh, imagining that it could be it could be something I watch a lot. Um, yeah, no, you know, I, there's lots of weird paper floating around. I, I'm not sure what the deal is, but um, it's just been a really really odd one um you know when i look at this trade itself though um you know the 41 and a half calls it looks like it could be uh some sort of stock replacement uh you know that's kind of my best bet uh but who knows to be honest 
you know, that that's a good bet. I'm also looking here at the open interest profile while we're while we're talking about this one. And there are about 163,000 of these went up today. There are about exactly 160,000 of the May 46s going up as well. And those are essentially worthless right now. So this could be someone reestablishing at a more relevant uh, relevant strike, even though we didn't see any paper going up on the 46s. So he could be he could be legging into a new strike. He could be just letting the other ones fly high and legging into a stupid even though that 46, again, not exactly too relevant right now. Or it could be, like I said, a straight-up stock replacement. A lot of stuff could be cooking with this. When this kind of size, uh, it really, really makes you wonder exactly what is going on out here and what the underlying and what other people are doing to facilitate and hedge against this trade. Uh, another interesting one, listeners, to keep an eye on if you're playing the home game. Watch the open interest tomorrow. And then uh, send us your own ideas. We like, we like to kind of facilitate the dialogue here on the old odd block. And a lot of times it's me and Andrew kind of going back and forth on some weird paper. But if you see weird stuff or something that catches your eye that we didn't talk about, or in turn, if you think we're, we're dead wrong about what we're analyzing on a name, you think something else happened, write in and let us know. We love to hear that sort of thing. Again, we're going to keep EEM on the to-be-watched list uh, this kind of size certainly merits further scrutiny. We're going to keep an eye on this one to see if it has some interesting, interesting developments coming up in the coming sessions. But that, and unfortunately, is all the time we have right now for the old odd block. And now we're going to keep on rolling right on into Alex's favorite segment because it's time for the Express Block. The Express Block. Brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade where and when you want for every level of trading. From advanced charting, free daily trading ideas, and free educational resources. Options Express by Charles Schwab is the online broker for all traders. Best of all, Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade stocks, options, and futures all in a single account. On powerful yet easy-use trading platforms including mobile devices. Visit OptionsExpress.com for your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, and welcome to the Express Block. This is, of course, the portion of the program where the Viceroy dons his fanciest of fancy caps and proceeds to take us on a behind-the-scenes tour into the land known as Options Express by Charles Schwab. Mr. Viceroy gave us a little bit of a glimpse earlier in the show but now take us take us behind the velvet rope and show us what was going on behind the scenes over there at ox today so a couple of threats today and and um we did touch on them earlier but uh big rally in the in the grains market and saw that volume in both the underlying futures and in the options um momentum stocks are still uh getting whacked a little bit uh Tesla's and the Amazons, uh, two names that are big on our desk, uh, still retreating a bit today. Um, but uh, innovation, I'll speak a little bit about that as I try to do every few shows. Uh, in terms of innovation, the idea hub for Schwab Mobile uh, is in its final days of test and training. Uh, we do some more training with the Schwab folks on Wednesday, but Idea Hub for Schwab Mobile should be out in the next couple of weeks. So we're very excited about that. Um, the, there are a few changes. Schwab Mobile only has two leg spreads. So uh, there won't be iron condors just yet. There will be credit put spreads and credit call spreads, but using the same metric. Trick, uh, and it was a good day overall. We were open right out of the the box. We were uh, uh, up all day. I said open. I meant to say up all day. Uh, and you know, last couple times we've had those up right out of the box. We've lost steam in the last hour. That wasn't the case today. Uh, generally, when we're up in the morning, it's uh, good economic news and good news out of Europe because. That time zone is still open. Uh, when we stay up in the afternoon, that's generally when Asia comes in. And here at OX, we have a big presence in that time zone in both uh, Singapore and Australia. So it was a good day overall. Glad to hear it, Mr. Viceroy. And now it's time to keep on rolling right on into our next segment, the strategy block. 
It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the Strategy Block. All right, and welcome to the Strategy Block. This is, of course, the portion of the program uh, where Uncle Mike steps on down from the mountains, a.k.a. the mole hills of St. Charles, Illinois, and puts on his smoking jacket and grabs those stone tablets and proceeds to dispense some options, wit and or wisdom. Uncle Mike, which is it going to be today, wit or wisdom? I'm going to try and do both. I'll do the best I can. Best I can. Oh, a tall order, sir. Well, by all means, try. All right. And with all this pressure on, I don't know if I can do it now. <laughs> um, all right. I want to talk to you today. Or I want to talk to everybody today about uh, closing out short options. Uh, we've talked on this show at least six trillion times about the importance of when your options are worth a penny, a dime, a nickel, whatever, uh, and you've achieved most of your profit on your short options uh, to get out of them. And so today we had, uh, for our clients, we had some put spreads with which we were in, and uh, we got out of them. So with that being said, on uh, the strategy with which we're using, uh, we're, we're kind of combined right now. And that's not always the case, but at this point, we are combined. So uh, one strategy, we have a longer-term call option uh, with which we're taking a smaller amount of client money and using that for the upside exposure to the marketplace. And then to finance that longer-term call option, we're using put spread, short put spreads to finance it. And so we've been able to gradually chip away at the cost of it throughout the last few months, and we're continuing to chip away, which is what our goal is, to uh, finance as much of the time premium and the long option as we possibly can. Uh, by the same token, we have another strategy with which we are long SPY, the underlying. We're also long a longer-term put option, and we are to protect it, and we're trying to use short put spreads to finance the long put option as well. Sometimes the, the option spreads match, sometimes they don't. We can talk about that in another show, but at this point in time, they are. So today, uh, going into today, we were short the 182-177 put spread on SPY uh, expiring this week. Uh, so the market went up and uh, we got out of it. it was just a situation to where it didn't make sense to stay in it. Uh, it's just a uh, disaster waiting to happen. So we got out of it for a pretty significant profit relative to the amount of premium with which we took in. So with that, what do we do the rest of this week then? Now we're at a point to where do we just simply stay long the put or long the call and just stay long premium for another week until we get a greater upside movement, a pullback or something along those lines? Do we sell yet another put spread? Uh, what do we do when we're in a situation like that? And we still, we have a need right now to get some theta to finance either the long call option or, or I should say as well as the long put option. So typically what we'll do is we've been having a five point increment between the strike prices on the put spreads. And just looking around through front week, back week, side week, whatever week we want to look at, just not finding anything attractive in terms of what would make sense for us to sell on the put spread side of it. So what we ended up doing was we ended up selling a 188-190 bear call spread uh, for the front week. And the reason with which we did that was because of the fact that, number one, we needed premium. That's the reason you sell any option ever is because you need to have the time premium in there. Uh, but number two, let's say a couple of things happen. If the market stays the same or goes down, then by gosh, we're geniuses for selling that. So what if it actually goes up? Well, if it actually does go up, a couple of things to keep in mind, we will have had a 25-point move to the upside in the S&P 500 over the course of the week. So if it does go up to the 188 level to where we're at our short strike price, I, consider, I still consider that a good problem to have. Now, with that in mind, it still took away a few more delta. If we were to just sell the 188 call against the SPY with which we owned, as well as the SPY call with which we owned, that still didn't, I still didn't feel comfortable with that because of the fact that it took away uh, more delta than I wanted to. And on top of that, let's say that uh, we do have more Fed, Fed people coming out saying, oh, we'll print all the money you guys want, no problem. If we do that, still don't feel comfortable taking away too much upside at this point. So because of that, we ended up selling the one, or I'm sorry, we ended up buying the 190 call in addition to it. 
It took away eight cents of the actual premium with which we were taking in on the 188 call. And we now, if for some reason we do have some major gap up or if something happens, then we still have all the upside we can possibly have past the 190 mark. So when doing things like this, folks, you need to kind of take into consideration what if the market goes up? What if the market goes down? What if the market stays the same? What if volatility goes up? What if volatility goes down? What if volatility stays the same, et cetera, et cetera? And in this case, if this does go against us, it's not going to hurt too badly. And I like being in things that when they go against us, it doesn't hurt too badly. And that is today's strategy block. All right. Thank you for that, Uncle Mike. And now we're going to keep on rolling right on into our next segment, the mail block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for the mail block. All right, and welcome to the Mail Block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we give you guys some uh, some time to join us here on the All Star Panel. Usually, we feature the Mail Block on Thursdays, but every once in a while, we like to surface some of your questions. Particularly, we have so many coming into the show. We want to make sure all of you guys get your chance to be answered here on the program. Uh, today's question comes in from a listener goes by the name of Dylan Harris, and he writes, "Hi." Well, hello, Dylan. <laughs> I started trading options about a year and a half ago and got burned a few times, which made me realize I didn't know uh, nearly what I thought I did and sent me back to the drawing boards. I've spent the time since then learning as much as I can about different option strategies and trying them in virtual accounts. I've come to the conclusion that diagonal spreads fit me pretty well. The question I have is whether there are ways to use delta as a trigger to, in the parentheses, in the case of diagonals, uh, roll the short strike down and or out, and if so, how successful have these been in implementation and which brokers have them? Thanks, uh, Dylan. This is an interesting question. Well, first off, Dylan, let me just say straight up, I'm glad uh, you're realizing your limitations from an options perspective and you're going back to the drawing board and educating yourself. That's a great thing. We like to see a lot of our listeners doing that. And I'm also glad you're getting a lot of value out of the program. I think this is a great show to listen to if you do want to go down that road. And now his, his specifics of his questions, uh, this has come in a lot. A lot of people want to seem to be able to do this for whatever reason, and yet the devil's really in the details when it comes to this. It's executing in some way off of the Greeks. You know, people have written in about Vega in the past, a lot in the past have also asked about Delta. Dylan clearly asking about that again. Uh, it's one of those things that sounds appealing to a lot of people. They love to say, hey, when the Delta of this spread hits whatever, 50, 75, I want to close out this leg and roll it down. Uh, but the problem is that's not as easy a thing to do as it might seem. Uh, Dylan and the rest of the listeners, you know, most of the different platforms that have different Greeks, the Greeks may differ a little bit. A lot of the platforms let you fudge some of the variables a little bit, too. You can input, input your own vol. You can input your own interest rate, whatever the case may be. That may change when you execute. Uh, there's a lot of different fudge factors in those variables, for lack of a better word, that makes executing off them a very difficult prospect. And I think a scary one for a lot of brokers as well, because people have come to expect a certain level of functionality and execution. They know when it hits a certain price, they're going to be filled, or at least their order is going to be activated. Uh, activating and trading via Greeks, not as precise of a thing. Uh, so quite frequently, you usually have to back it out yourself. You have to look and see at what price equates to what Greek you're looking at. In this case, Delta, maybe you can do a little bit of playing with your broker's tools to see where that Delta you're looking for, what price that equates to. And you're probably better off working that price level yourself uh, rather than uh, having to look for a broker who does that. Bear in mind, of course, all of these things are variable. Delta is going to change with gamma. Vega is going to change the whole equation. So when you're working these orders, <laughs> you have to stay on top of everything that's going on in your underlying. Uh, Alex, is that pretty much your take as well? I'm sure you guys get this on probably an almost daily basis over there at OX. Why can't I trade off Vega? Why can't I trade off Delta? Uh, what do you guys normally say to these inquiries? Yeah, it comes up all the time, and I think you did a really good job of talking about the relevance of the Greeks. Um, some people seem fixated on the Greeks, and I'm a firm believer that being able to calculate the Greeks uh, will not make you a better trader. Uh, I've talked about this on the show before. I think the Greeks are about setting expectations 
expectations, not necessarily about being a, a better trader. Um, the listener talked about the fact that he's traded in a virtual environment. I would set some of these up in a virtual environment, and I would set what I call intuitive price targets. I mean, uh, I like diagonals. In fact, there's a diagonal build in Hub coming. Um, um, but, uh, you know, I, do Greeks really help with diagonals? It, it doesn't hurt to know the Greeks. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about the two traders I knew that just had phenomenal rates of return who couldn't calculate the Greeks, uh, didn't bother to calculate it, not couldn't. They were just good, intuitive traders. And, you know, they traded names that they knew were comfortable with, and they looked at price points that, uh, you know, they thought, if it gets here, I'll do this. Um, and I think that's the key to being a successful trader. I think some of it is intuitive. Uh, and I think think having the ability to micromanage the Greeks uh, oftentimes makes things more complicated than they need to be. Yeah, you know, everything else you said in your in your email there, Dylan, is spot on. I think we're all excited that you're using, vir using virtual accounts. That's a great thing. Uh, kick the tires before you put your actual money at risk, that you're trying new spreads, that you've, that you've discovered a strategy that seems to work for you. You seem to have a decent handle on diagonals. Uh, those are all great things. Uh, I just wouldn't I wouldn't hold your breath for executing on some sort of Greek. You're much better off just finding the price that works for you and working the order that way, because right, as to my knowledge, and we've looked at this a lot of different ways, uh, no one really offers anything like that. The closest we've seen uh, are some OTC platforms where people like to execute in notions of Vega and that sort of thing. But that's really nothing that you can access. Uh, so really, when it comes down to trading via Delta, at least for the foreseeable future, it's not going to happen, Dylan, unfortunately. <laughs> so good question. And everyone else, keep them coming. We love to hear from you guys here on the old option block. And now we're going to keep on rolling right on into our final segment, Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, and welcome to Around the Block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we tell you what's on our radar, what we're watching for the rest of this week. And it was indeed an interesting start to the week. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we had, of course, the big planting report setting the ags off onto a wild ride today. We, of course, had uh, Miss Yellen talking up the market again today. So a lot of things given strong boosts to the markets here, at least in the beginning of it. The question now becomes uh, what will unfold uh, the rest of the week? Uncle Mike, we'll start with you. What are you keeping an eye on for the rest of this week, sir? I think we need to get like an, an alert tool on um, on a, a, on Options Express. We'll get it to where whenever uh, some type of a Fed, the Fed is saying anything at all, uh, just it has something to where it just gives you like some type of an electrical shock to get by your computer immediately. <laughs> That's what it seems to to be these days. But no, just watching the uh, um, the news in terms of seeing if the Fed says anything for uh, quantitative easing or for whether they're going to continue what they're doing, whatever the case may be. And then obviously everything that's going on in Russia. So nothing too shocking that uh, we're looking at. Also, I do want to see if uh, if uh, maybe we've hit a top with bonds. Uh, we're starting to come back a little bit, but not a lot. So definitely watching the 30-year TLT and that type of thing. Mr. Alex, same question for you. What are you watching the rest of this week, sir? Um, keep in mind, last couple of weeks here to make an IRA contribution up until April 15th, if you haven't filed your taxes. Um, looks like Putin blinked a little bit, and the market seems to have liked that. And I think that's been the, the contributing factor to our weekend volatility, kind of staying in. Um, as uh, – Uncle Mike said, uh, we're looking at rates and the volatility of rates, and the volatility of rates has come in a lot. Uh, our tenure is back trading a, a small volatility, and the, the European tenures, the German and the UK, are still a little more volatile than average, but they've come in a little bit. Uh, no real earnings, but hopefully by the time we get into earnings season, uh, uh, Crimea will be behind us uh so that's what we're keeping an eye on 
And last but not least, Mr. Sebastian, what are you watching for the rest of this week, sir? Uh, Non-farm payrolls at the end of the week and uh, going to watch that volatility. Should be interesting to see whether uh, the, you know, I, I was jo I was jokingly saying that VXX was the broken clock that's working twice a day. And uh, I'm, I'll am i be interested to see if it continue if it actually goes back to being broken. I don't know if you know this, but UVXY is the new hotness. Everyone's writing in asking about that one these days. So you might have to add that to your radar of predictably crappy uh, VIX ETPs. <laughs> All right, and that is going to do it for the Around the Block segment. But before we go, let me check in with each of my cohorts here on the old All-Star panel to see what they have cooking in their respective necks of the woods that may interest you until the next time all of us can gather here together around the old all-star panel starting off with you uh, mr sebastian what is cooking in the land of swan and or option pit you know it's all about the reinsurance my friend and that's that's what is cooking uh swan re and uh that's what i'm spending a lot of my time on so uh that that's that's been my that's been our baby and that's what i'm all over so you're knocking on the doors in the local neighborhood getting all the housewives to buy more insurance that's what it is oh that's exactly right no it's a uh it's a uh you know i'm not allowed to get too deep into it but uh it, it's it's basically it's a lot like being a cutco knife salesman <laughs> i've always thought that would be a good career choice for you <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right. And Mr. Tussaud, what is coming up in the land of RCM Wealth Advisors? Well, this month we are going to be having a series of webinars on Tuesday afternoons right after the close. Topics to be announced either Thursday or next Monday. So we're not quite – we don't have all the topics down pat yet, but we do have the date and time set. Stay tuned. And if they want to find out more about that, they go over to the main RCM website, sir rcmwealthadvisors.com slash webinar there you go listeners you know where to go if you want to find out more about the old rcm webinar train and when it's rolling into a station near you and last but certainly not least speaking of the endless flow of webinars and educational events mr viceroy what is cooking in the land of options express education so this last saturday we had a live event in baton rouge and uh had great participation. Uh, uh, when we do a live event, we also do it as a virtual event on the site. And I understand that the team also had a good time in New Orleans this weekend as a cross benefit. But our next live event will be Saturday, April 26th at the Marriott in Schomburg. And uh, I think they're going to let me have five or ten minutes on that one to to go over a hub. Uh, but if you can't make it out on the 26th, the live events are simulcast on the site. Come to OptionsExpress.com, and you can see the full schedule of events. A couple webinars this week, uh, Wednesday the 2nd, uh, uh, Nina's going to do a platform and site tour. And then after that, she's going to talk about the benefits of long puts as a trade into themselves. On Thursday, she's going to talk about IRA strategy and hedges uh, would come to the site. All the events are free. Um, just register and you're welcome to attend any of the events. All right. Check it out. OptionsExpress.com if you'd like to learn more. And on behalf of the Viceroy and Uncle Mike Tussaud and the Greasy Meatball himself and, of course, myself as well, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the program and, of course, for writing in with such great questions. Keep them coming, and we'll see you next time right here on The Option Block. The Option Block was brought to you by Options Express by Charles Schwab. Don't spend time worrying about your broker at Options Express by Charles Schwab. Security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express by Charles Schwab lets you trade with confidence. Confidence, stocks, options, and futures all in one account. Trade with a specialist.
Visit www.optionsexpress.com to open your free account. Options Express by Charles Schwab is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. 